That's tricky because we have been, I'd say me, Chris, and Barnaby have been a little harsh on on new breweries that claim to be metal. There, I, I have to say that it has become the thing to do, you know? So I guess it has to be true. It has to, you can't just make a beer that's metal. It has to be throughout your whole culture. You don't just go to a metal show once a year kind of thing. You know, you're born into it, really. You know? Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope that you've had a great week so far. I most certainly have been. Before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'm also asking you to rate it and write a review. Why do you ask? Because when you write a review, you could be the person that sways someone to become a future Vox and Hops head. When someone's looking for a new podcast to invest their time into, what do they do? They scroll down, they read the reviews. If those reviews reflect something that they are interested in, something that touches upon their core values, they are most likely going to give that podcast a chance. So please take the time to rate and write a review for the Vox and Hops Metal podcast, because that would be something that I would truly, truly appreciate. Now, on today's episode, I am with metal and beer legends Todd Hogg and Chris Bogus of Three Floyds Brewing. This is Vox and Hops episode number 265. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm with Chris Bogus and Todd Haug of Three Floyds Brewing. I have been waiting a long time to say those words. Uh, Vox and Hops has been around for over two years now. It is crazy that it's taken me this long to sit down with the, the original metal and beer people. So how are you guys doing today? Doing good. Awesome. Thank you. How are, yeah. Very, very stoked to be with you both. Uh, I like to start these things off recently with a shitty question so we can go to better places afterwards. Uh, how did you guys cope with the glorious year that is now behind us of 2020? <laughs> uh, <laughs> go ahead, Chris. Um, it was horrible. It was, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to run a factory in this kind of condition. And it's the nightmares aren't ending yet, so it's still kind of twenty twenty plus right now. Mm-hmm. It's the bonus time right now. We're in the bonus time. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, uh, lots of speed balls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Having spoken to a bunch of brewers and, you know, breweries, I know that a lot of them really suffered because they normally pump a bunch of brews into kegs and those go into bars. Is that something that you guys got hit with? Yeah, pretty hard. Um, When it when the shutdown happened on the 15th of March last year, I mean, we our production cratered pretty hard and then uh, everything went into package and we were able to catch up. Uh, but it took, uh, I think, until like July. Todd, does that sound right? It was July, August. Yeah. To kind of get our volumes back. Um, you know, just freaking out the whole time. Still freaking out. Hmm. Is that how you guys are capable to expand into different areas now? Because you have all this extra beer that needs to go somewhere? That was actually planned. Yeah. Todd built Todd built their new brew house. Um, <laughs> and that went on. on it, you did. Well, oversaw it anyway. And uh what was that was in the summer of 19. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have our new markets open yet. So it was kind of slow going at the, in the beginning. And then we started pumping, started, we're starting to pump out a lot of beer there right now. Yeah. As, lu- as, yeah, as luck would have it, we had just kind of put together a sales team and management to um, launch some new markets before the pandemic. And those, that, that was already kind of set up. So we just delayed it lot later until last year, and then um, the everyone's the sales guys are like, "Well, we could still do this. We have this new brewery." Luckily, we were able to shift all of our production um, after we figured out that kegs were gone, sales mm-hmm. were gone there, into bottles and cans, and that's. I mean, we were lucky to be at that position in our growth to be able to do that. A lot of breweries couldn't. Do we have friends that? sold all their beer draft only and they had to scramble to, yeah, yeah. F- to figure packaging out so we were we just kind of 
So I just have to, I hate to say it and laugh, but um, they, we couldn't have planned it better, actually, um, because we were able to just kind of dodge it a little bit. And uh, you know, obviously the pub suffered, that whole culture of the pub and Dark Lord, they suffered. But from a production standpoint, we were able to just shift and move everything into a different package and roll it out in a different market. So we had increased production because of the new facility to answer your question. So we... It wasn't just because of the draft volume that had dropped. It was already planned. And there was an increase in production coming anyway. So, Good. Well, that's an excellent, excellent timing. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, we signed with uh, our East Coast distributor in early early March of 20. So, like, it had, we were in New York City signing papers and the pandemic hit, like, a week later. So we were kind of set the wheels in motion at that point. Hmm, very, very fortuitous that that it happened that it happened that way versus the opposite a few weeks later yeah vox and hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends and talking about their lives music and craft beer what are what are we drinking today on each of our sides uh let's present what we got going on i'm having uh i don't you know i don't know if you call it craft beer anymore devil's backbone but i got one of their lagers on a little road trip and it's killer awesome how about you todd um since it's uh morning for me um i'm drinking a can of coffee from dark matter um they're vanilla suburbs uh, yeah it's like 600 milligrams of caffeine so You'll, you'll be awake by the end of this. I doubt it. On my side, I have Montreal's Dark Lord. I call them that. They're, they're nothing close to the Dark Lords. Uh, <laughs> what you guys pull off, but I call them that because they only brew dark beers, and I think that's super cool. This is uh, Brasserie Borregals. It's their Imperial Macadam. It is a vanilla macadamia nut Imperial Stout aged in bourbon barrels. Something that uh, will insult your your laws of purity. <laughs> Beer. No, I mean we're prostitutes too. <laughs> That's fa- fancy, dude. <laughs> yeah. They're killer. They they're doing really cool stuff here. They they seriously only do black beers, and they actually put out a double dry hopped IPA last summer that just fucked up everyone's mind because it wasn't a black IPA. It was just a black New England, uh, which is very <laughs> cool. I'm gonna crack this. You guys crack whatever you guys got going on, and uh, we'll do a little cheers, and we'll keep going. That is pretty tough. All black beers. Yeah, it's as a brewer, that's um, that sounds kind of fun. Yeah, challenging. Yeah, awesome. Cheers. Stoked to be here, guys. Cheers. Cheers, man. Bourbon kick on the nose and super sweet, nutty killer. Nice pastry stout. Love it. Love it. Pastry stout at two p.m. It's going to be a good yeah. Saturday. <laughs> it's only downhill from here. <laughs> That's right. Um, let's talk about beer. Let's talk about your very first beers. Do you remember the first beers that you guys had? Clearly. Yeah, clearly. Um, well, my first beer I ever had, um, a buddy of mine, uh, we were on our bikes. We were 13. Somehow we managed to get a 12-pack of PBR. Yes. <clears throat> that was the first time I was drunk on beer. Um, but my first taste of beer, I was in Germany, actually, playing soccer. And the host family um, laughed and served me pizza, which was horrible, and this little <laughs> mini keg of beer. And that was the same year, but I thought it was horrible. Uh, I didn't know what beer, I didn't know what it was supposed to taste like, I didn't like it. But then when I got home, I was all about, I had to drink beer. Um, so then from there on, I, uh, from PBR, uh, drank crappy macro beers until I was 17, and then... The guys in the band uh, turned me on to good, better beers, everything from Pete's Wicked Ale and Sierra Nevada and Celebration Ale and uh, Anchor Liberty Ale, everything that was available in the late 80s, um, I tried. So that was the, it was the end. It was the start <laughs> right there. So. That's the slippery slope right there. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Chris? Uh, mine had to be either a Coors Banquet or a Stroh's for my uncle. It was one or the other because uh, they were really in the Coors Banquet. This was right around, you know, I was like eight or nine. So that's when Smokey and the Bandit came out. And that was a big oh, yeah. deal. Um, so I tasted it, you know, and I thought it was gross. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in, definitely in high school, it was Milwaukee's best. I mean, all day. And then into, into college, too. And then the gateway beers for me, you know, being in Oklahoma and Texas were were Newcastle and Guinness, and then that was kind of the beginning. Mm. And then when I had a Liberty uh, Anchor Liberty, it kind of blew my mind. Mm. You know, in the in the yeah. mid nine mid early nineties. 
I remember drinking a lot of uh, that stout from Australia, Chief Stout. Remember that? It was in a cool bottle. That was a treat. Like that was, just, you know, something we could get regularly, but was um, exotic and like a big stout compared to Guinness, at least. Um, Moosehead was a was the, an exotic beer for me in Oklahoma. <laughs> well, in Minnesota, Coors was exotic because we couldn't get it. There's a guy down the street when I where I grew up that. Somehow I bootlegged it, and I would see as a kid, I would bike by his house and see a pallet of Coors in his garage. I don't know how he got it, but... A pallet? Yeah. Oh, my yep. God. Yeah. He, he had good friends. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk about brewer stories. How did you guys end up brewing beer, living for the world of beer? Um, I got a art degree at a football college so i was uh really <laughs> yeah super awesome degree uh, you just stop right there <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> i uh i was a waiter when i got out of school and um i kind of i managed to start waiting tables at a brew pub called rock bottom in houston texas and uh and i want to say six six months to a year after i started working there uh, i was able to sneak into the brew house because it looked awesome and I like the beers, you know, it's the first real fresh beer I've ever had. Um, and six months later, the the guy that taught me left and he went to open another rock bottom and I, you know, I barely knew what to do, still barely know what to do. But uh, <laughs> six months of training, I was able to repeat what he told me. And uh, that was the end of that. That was like 1995. How about you, Todd? Um, well. Let's see, I started, uh, I got into beer because the guy's in the band and I got home from tour and decided I needed to know how to brew. So I started home brewing. My brother was selling, um, working for a local company in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, a company that sold like uh, outerwear for like uh, active you know, skiing and stuff. So he had a store in Wisconsin that sold stuff for sports outside and also it was a homebrew store. At the time there was a lot of homebrew stores. So... I had that catalog for my brother, and uh, I saw their homebrew kit, so I ordered it, and I surprised Jeff, our bass player, um, because uh, he had no he'd be into it. And I started homebrewing, and then later that year, I uh, did a course at Summit Brewing in St. Paul. It was a beer styles course led by Mark Stutter, the president, founding guy. And uh, I asked him, hey, do you guys ever need help? And he said, uh, yeah, we, we do. There's a list. Well, three months later, I called, and... Uh, spoke with the guy on the phone and said, hey, I'm, I did this thing with Mark, and he told me to call, put my name on the list, and I thought it'd be like months of waiting, and then I got a call the next week to come in to help package and bottle. So I show up, it was me and a guy from a temp agency across the packing table uh, from me, um, hand packing uh, bottles into six packs. And from that day on, I never, I worked at Summit for almost five years after that, it was brewing, uh, a year later and I kind of found a place that uh, John the guy that answered the phone and, and called me back was uh, ended up being my mentor and uh, showed me sent me on a path that I kind of followed with um, you know all the uh, uh, building stuff and repairing stuff that's not um, not technically brewing but it it has to happen for brewing to be successful so that kind of set me on my course of liking to take things apart and fix them and make them run uh, and brewing at the same time, so that's amazing. That's amazing. And, and yeah, every every band needs a guy like that that can take apart an amp yeah. <laughs> and put it back together because it's gonna break. <laughs> it's gonna happen on tour, and it's the same thing in a brewery. Every brewery needs that guy that can just jump in there and fix it, <laughs> right? Or at least, yeah, or at least get to, at least make it so you can safely get through the brew. You know? Yeah. 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 One hundred percent. Or finish that show. Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's talk about metal. Um, talk, tell me about your, your early life as metalheads. Uh, how did you end up being a metalhead? I um, I wasn't a metalhead. I actually was into, I uh, started playing guitar when I was seven and um, followed my brother's and sister's musical interests. So I was into classic rock, uh, you know, early Van Halen, um, stuff like that. And then when I got to be in my teens, I fell in love with... Uh, Fusion, um, Al Di Miola and Pat Metheny and um, everything, uh, John Lupani and then Alan Holdsworth and, mm -hmm. and uh, all those all that stuff that 
was not metal and was about uh, music theory and everything else. So I kind of I was a snob a little bit, and uh, <laughs> when I first turned, actually still kick myself in eighth grade, I turned down an opportunity to see Metallica. Huh. So that would have been in eighty in nineteen eighty four, and I said no. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then it wasn't until I got into high school that a friend of mine um, said, "Hey, this band, local band, is looking for a guitar player. I think you're." technique and style would fit and he gave me this cassette as power mad and i listened to it and i made a demo and i was i kind of like like it, it struck a chord in me if you will like i was like the, the music was important i felt it you know um and at that point i had a newfound respect for that was a junior in high school so i loved all of a sudden metallica made sense and i couldn't believe how amazing it was and but i still love fusion i like i still love them both so from that point on, I, so I started my metal um, love as a listener probably late compared to most people. So as a result, I'm still in the I'm still at way into it, if probably more now than I used to be, which I think is awesome. A lot of people have kind of drifted away from it, which is lame. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have gotten into it after you, Todd. Then really? because I was classic rock Led Zeppelin to the bone um, until I graduated high school and then when i got in college someone played uh cause of death and that changed my life but that was like you know i don't know when that come out 89 or 90 oh, uh, but yeah. i heard it for the first time in like 91 and that was that was my I, okay i was like okay now i like metal and then i listened to black sabbath and then i listened to slayer but it was cause of death that kind of started everything for me a killer record um yeah let's talk about your first shows do you remember the first shows that you guys went to go see uh, luckily my parents um my dad and my mom had a business that they could like actively barter it was called in the 80s on the trade but um so i got to go to a bunch of shows at the carlton celebrity room which is in the movie fargo really? um yeah so i got to see a bunch of crazy stuff everything from bob hope um uh with Bob Bacharach and Carol Bayer Sager and all these like the Oak Ridge Boys, like crazy stuff that a ten year old would never think he should go to. So I had, I was exposed to live music almost weekly through my parents. Um, so then I started playing shows when I was I know, twelve, and then I have all ever since the pandemic started. But then my first arena concert was Jethro Tull. Nice. And I went with a buddy's older sister, um, and then my first kind of. Hard Rock concert was Van Halen, 1984. Wow. It was amazing. I can yeah, imagine that. Sweet. Super hype excitement. Oh, yeah. It's good. crazy. But they opened with Unchained, and I lost my shit. I just, like, completely <laughs> freaked out. Was Diamond Dave jumping? Doing oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right when the lights went on? Yeah. Like, cool. Oh, he was so killer back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Uh, my first concert was Cool in the Gang. Whoa. Um, yeah, it was Roger open for Cool in the Gang. It was pretty badass. And that was at a that was at a uh an arena. And I think oh it must have been twelve. But um yeah, I don't know why my parents let me go. It was just me and my buddy and we were just twelve year old kids at Cool in the Gang. <laughs> Different era. <laughs> I hope you dressed up. I had I probably had a Terry Cloth shirt on, I don't know. Yeah. Some boots, fuzzy boots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then my first metal show, man, I can't remember. You know, in college, I saw some, I saw like a band called Carnage. That was a death metal band from Florida. Um, they weren't that good, but it was, it was fun. Wait, no, the band was called Homicide. Mm -hmm. Um, they were really good. Um, and the first metal, you know, I was kind of into like butthole surfers and stuff. So I didn't really go to metal shows until, uh, until after school, like that, I had to move to Texas, and that's all. You know, I'd see Dio and Motorhead and all the time. I was yeah. that's when I met Barnaby uh, Todd, and he would take me to all those shows. Cool. Yeah, I remember seeing. Go ahead. Oh, and then when I moved to, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of uh, giving you more than you asked yeah. for, Matt. No worries. I moved. I bounced around with Rock Bottom and moved to Long Beach, California, and that's when I started seeing tons of shows. I'd see High on Fire four times a year. You know, for eight years in a row, it was incredible. Um, you know, and if you're in the Los Angeles area, there's always a show. So right. that's where I kind of got in my time. 
That's amazing. It's like that in Montreal. We're very lucky here in Montreal to just be, you know, any night of the week before the pandemic, there was multiple shows going on right. most of the time. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, what is the last show that you saw before the pandemic shut us down? Boy, shit. I don't know. We we just got done playing some shows with the. I play bass and uh, um, a, a fellow brewer friend of ours, Eric Ogershock's band, Kenny of the Skull, and we just to, we're doing shows right up to it. And then a bunch got canceled as it happened. Hmm. So I don't know what I'd seen. I mean, so I had those shows that I was at, but there's some festival in Chicago, and then um, some shows we did in St. Paul and uh, Milwaukee. Um, what was the last show we went to? Yeah, I can't remember. I don't, I don't know if I can either. For I know my, that the, the sleep show on New Year's Eve was that New Year's Eve, wasn't it? Yeah. Because <laughs> because uh, uh, last year uh, weed was made legal in Illinois, so sleep played yes. on New Year's Eve as it as the clock turned. It was pretty amazing. That it, that sounds like it a was, genius idea. Whoever it, said it was that. It's a pretty up. amazing <laughs> smoke out. <laughs> whoever yeah, said that. I think up. I missed that show. Yeah, I don't know where you were. Yeah, I was out of town or something. That's a killer idea. It might have been like, uh, it could have been like a decibel fest. was my last show, which is sad. Hmm. Which is a perfect transition because I'm going towards metal and beer. How did you guys figure out that metal and beer go so well together? You know, Three Floyds is <laughs> Surly and Three Floyds are, are basically <laughs> the OGs of this. So, so at what point did you realize that this is a match made in heaven? Oh, it's just kind of natural for us. I mean, that's what we like. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about Barnaby again. He was uh, really good at, at connecting those dots with musicians. Like he was just kind of a shameless dude and he would just be, hey, let's hang out, let's make a beer. So that was kind of, he started that all for us. Um, you know, back when we did that first beer with Pelican, uh, I want to say 10 years ago or more. Yeah. Wow, was that, that was the but, first band collab? Yeah, for us. But also we were living it. I mean, we were living it. We were, you know, we worked for a company, me, Barnaby, and Chris. We worked for a company, Rock Bottom. We were up brewers that ran our own breweries. And we saw each other maybe once or twice a year. But when we did, we were the metal guys, and we were just like, like, you know, uh, get, get attracted to each other because of that, but also because there's a repelling force because all the other brewers were hippies and the mm. company was based in Colorado. So it became a us versus them. Not that we're, they're still our friends, but as far as um, who we were and who we identified with musically and the attitude that we felt carried it over into our beer because we were into metal and we wanted the, our beers to be metal, but we were trapped in this company that would never allow that, you know, would never allow the beers to be perceived as metal and marketed that way. So um, that just kind of festered and grew. Um, and as we all moved on from rock bottom, we carried that torch as high and as hard as we could and um, kind of developed into what it is today. Yeah. They, you know, it's rock bottom's fault because they would make us listen to rust, rust, rust of root. And yeah. it was just, Big it was hell. Yeah, eating the blowfish. It was just they, they drove us to do it. Yeah, and you go and you step in the brew house, and I would have just like brutal shit on, like like three feet away through glass, two customers eating during lunch into the brew house, and I'm just listening to whatever as loud as I can. Same with Chris, um, and they're like smiling, and I'm in there smiling. Who did they know that? We were we were driven and motivated to make it through those days. You know, being in a fish aquarium like like a you know an attraction at a at the at a brew pub, people to watch work. Um, we were listening to metal and it kept us sane. I love that. I, I've had Chris Dodge on the podcast. I've had Albert from Decibel. I've had um, the original Adam on on the podcast, and I asked them all this question: What makes a metal brewery? Because now that you guys are the OGs, but there, there's a lot more of them now. So, so what what defines a metal brewery? That's tricky because we have been. I'd say me, Chris, and Barnaby have been a little harsh on on new breweries that claim to be metal. Um, <laughs> but, Posers. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, I, I have to say that it has become the thing to do. You know, um, 
So I guess it has to be true. It has to. You can't just make a beer that's metal. It has to be throughout your whole culture. I think um, you don't just go to a metal show once a year, kind of thing. Mm. You know, more or- organic, kind of. You know, you're born into it, really. Mm. Yeah. I love so it's not like that guy that that we all know this person that claims to be a metalhead that has that one metal shirt that he puts pulls on and then goes to his show and then goes through the rest of his life with his his business casual yeah is lifestyle. it a man of war shirt is it a man of war shirt <laughs> man of war shirts are the best they are so, the so, best. So, you, you know there are a lot of <laughs> metal breweries or people deeming themselves as a metal brewery how do you guys feel about that you, you mentioned poser you said <laughs> and just being a jackass yeah yeah but is it yeah. something that, you know, you you were the first for so long and you guys were the, that brewery. Um, what about when you saw all these other ones popping up? Was that something like, oh, cool, our culture is growing? Or was it more of like a who do they think they are type syndrome, syndrome or reaction? Sorry. Um, I thought I thought it was cool for sure. I think it's cool. Yeah, I would say it was um, at first it was who are these? Well, that's how a lot of us brewers, we went from you know, under 2,000 breweries in this country to almost 10,000 breweries. So most of us that have been doing this for 20, 30 years for a living are like, who are all these assholes opening new breweries? <laughs> so it's the same thing with, like, who are all these guys that are in the metal now? But I've saw, I've softened. I, I think we have to, uh, we have to, I, I, I'm softened up. It's like, the more the merrier. And I'm not going to judge them because we need metal to survive and and it's it's uh with everything changing the way it is as far as how music is released and how people uh even learn about new music and bands um we need all the help we can get so true so i'm less harsh i used to be pretty me and barnaby especially would be pretty brutal but it's also because it made us laugh so (laughs) yeah yeah it's fun to be Fun to be dicks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all have to work together. We're all fighting yeah. the same big monsters, whether it be, you know, commercial rock music or pop music, the metal industry. We're trying to, you know, hash out our space and find new listeners every day, get a new generation into the old classic metal so that they can keep this genre alive. I, I feel like metal is on fire it's it's more popular than ever same thing with craft beer so they go so well together which is why vox and hops works so so i I definitely encourage everyone just to work together and to collaborate and to to keep spreading the good word of metal and craft beer which is where collabs come in just so perfectly so you mentioned barnaby encouraged the first one for pelican uh i have had a few of the three floyds collabs they were super sick i was on tour with cannibal corpse and obituary uh, and obituary got their hopped in half delivered onto our bus by one of you actually yeah it might have been me it was uh delicious um those guys uh were super cool um as you know you work for them uh but you know they like budweiser i mean they were they weren't trying to hide what what they were into so i tried to make something that was good and and, uh that they would like so i'm not sure how much they liked it but they were appreciative and cool about it they were very cool whenever you know that all the beers went into this communal ice thing on the bus yeah. and cryptopsy being cryptopsy we like to drink beer <laughs> so we would dig into this ice thing and every once in a while our hand would fall onto one of the hopped in halves and we'd pull yeah. it up and we'd look over at the tardy boys <laughs> and be like is, <laughs> is this cool and they were always like it's cool you can have it <laughs> yeah it's awesome <laughs> we also really enjoyed the um I, I got to taste one of the, the amber smash faces there. But let's talk about your, your mentality towards uh, doing collabs for bands. Is that uh, t- Talk me through uh, how you think about that. How does these relationships form? Um, is it complicated? I'm sure you guys get hit up by way more bands than you actually do. So how do you guys decide who to make a collab for? So we've got, uh, you know, we, Dave Witte is kind of our Johnny Appleseed of spreading the word. Um, big fans of him and and the band, of course. But as an individual, he's like one of the best dudes. And uh, when um, when we get in 
to some like like cannibal corpse or uh obituary for instance i i don't know if he if he helped me kind of close the dots but i think he did like he was able to get me in contact with those guys um and that was a lot of fun to make beer with those two those two legendary bands so it's more like you know guys i want to make beer with just because i love the music um I'm not looking to do a ton of them because it does take some effort, you know, and I don't want to fuck it up. So uh, we've been a little bit more selective lately and, and uh, I'm not trying to, not trying to push it, push the issue with any certain bands, but um, I don't know if I answered your question. But uh, no, yeah, you did. You definitely did. So I was just more curious, like how often do you guys get hit up? I imagine there's bands that are hitting you up all the time. <laughs> a lot. So so how how do you how do you go about a selection process? Well, it's gotten easier because I in the last couple of years uh, I've gotten some pretty amazing ones. I don't even know if I've told Chris about them all because, to be honest, they won't. I knew I know they're not wouldn't happen. So now my my standard my reply is to just tell them I'm of our limited distribution area mm-hmm. and they, they immediately never come back. <laughs> so, and that's, I mean, that's how you shut down Motley Crue. That's how you shut down uh, Motorhead. Anyone that's suddenly, you hear from their manager and they want to make a beer, you're, it's, it's clearly marketing. Yeah. Which yeah, yeah. is the number one thing that I don't, I wouldn't touch. It has to be, I think mean, Chris said that it's, I, it's usually, I have to be a fan like I have to go to their show and be there and maybe meet them before I get a chance to pitch it, you know? So year, for years, me, Barnaby, and Chris would work it. I'd go to a show and, and the guys I got to know in Skeleton Witch, I would be like, hey, you guys, have you talked to Barnaby yet? So I would hammer him in Minnesota and Scott would be like, no, I forgot. I got to get a hold of him. And then I'd, again, make sure that Bar- he had Barnaby's contact info. And back and forth. So we kind of, we would kind of triangulate a little bit. In Minnesota, I didn't have the opportunity to do a lot of collabs, official collabs that got packaged, but we were doing a, um, a lot of show only, draft only beers, uh, which I thought was pretty cool because it was hyper, hyper small. And um, so uh, it, it worked out. The band got a bigger draw at the show. It was a cross promotion kind of thing, but also um, it kind of kept the hyper small crafty kind of component to it. Um, Cause once you got a package of beers, it, it gets more difficult. You got to somehow get the story all the way through to the liquor, through the liquor store. And a lot of customers mm. don't get the band collab beers. They don't understand it. They just, except for three Floyds because it doesn't look different than their normal beer. So it works with three Floyds. Um, but most other breweries, it looks like an oddball that they just like a cast out beer that doesn't make any sense. Um, it looks so, like that, it, me, that metal shirt. Yeah, in, exactly. In, in the man of war shirt in, in the business casual drawer. <laughs> right. Where it works, works at three Floyds. So yeah. Yeah, that oily, oily abs works really well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. So, so you guys, mostly it's you guys approaching bands versus the opposite way. See, I didn't know that. I think that's super cool. Uh, it's kind of a 50, 50. Yeah. But usually we know them. Yeah. Like the cannibal with cannibal and obituary, it was just definitely me going after those guys. Cause I love them. Right. Yeah. And the amount of times people say Dave, Woody's name on this podcast is who? Dave. Yeah. Woody. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Dave. He's the best. <laughs> Let's talk about hype. Uh, I think you guys have the most hype ever when it comes to Dark Lord Day. Uh, how did you figure out that doing something limited, something cool, uh, and obviously it ties to metal because, you know, when there's those limited runs of either merch drops or, or vinyls or, you know, it sells out, it's gone, and, and Dark Lord is always gone. So I've never had one, to be honest. So, um, how did you figure that out that this would work? The, the the music day, or you know, it was that was Nick for sure. He was uh, that's all Nick. Su- yeah, super into to making beer that was just ridiculous. Um, maybe the first to do it really, and uh, it just kind of became this thing that he you know he released it once a year, and uh, it grew to be this big event. And then at some point we we're like, well, why don't we just make it a music festival too? It's amazing. And and we just party our ass off, <laughs> sell a bunch of beer, drink a bunch of beer, 
Um, and it just kind of went from there. But yeah, it was kind of like the, you know, the early, the early 2000s, uh, when like the rate beer in that thing kind of really helped Three Floyds. And, uh, you know, Nick was making these big, gigantic beers and people would, you know, and we're Chicago area too. So there's lots of people that, that were able to come by and, and drink the beer or, you know, get on online and, and, uh, you know, tell people that they liked it and thought it was good, that kind of stuff. Very cool. Very, very cool. That's smart. You got to, you got to play with the tools at hand to, to exactly. push yourself forward as, as always, always let's wrap this up. Classic, classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. Probably never happens to you guys. Cause you guys have been in the industry for a long time, but every once in a while it happens to everyone. What are your hangover cures? Oh, geez. So I think my favorite one is probably the Michelada. It just goes straight to the, you know the the Mexican red beer. I love that. Um, and then I'm usually good to go after a couple of those. <laughs> How about you? For myself, I suffer in silence, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I got I got I got two young kids, so uh, they yeah. didn't, they didn't drink yeah. the beers, right? So, and uh, right. another bastardization of beer: a fruited sour will always put me back on my feet. We got a really good brewery here in Montreal called Pub Brewski. They make these things called brew juices, and uh, you drink a brew juice and you're right back on track. It's a fruited kettle sour with a fruit fruit puree in it. So I like that. Uh, I like that name. Brew, yes. What is it? Brew, brew juice. Brew juice, and I'm not sure that this. Nice. Epi- by the time this episode comes out, my collab with them, Brutal Juice, will be out. Nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> How about you, Todd? What, what's what's your hangover gear? Um, yeah, anything carbonated, um, like uh, you know, sparkling wine or mimosa, um, and then uh, your Bloody Mary, and some and some something to eat. Usually uh, sets me up for a nap. And then I get up and ready to go. Excellent. Classics. Chris Todd, thank you so, so much for taking the time talking to me uh, about life, metal, and craft beer. I truly, truly appreciate it. I can't wait till this pandemic is over and I can be back out on tour and come and visit you guys in the flesh and hang out for real. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, I had a great time hanging out with Chris and Todd. Living beer and metal legends. I had such a blast finally connecting with the original beer and metal people. They make killer beer, metal as fuck. I absolutely love them. Next time I'm anywhere near them, I am coming out to hang out. Todd, Chris, get ready. We're going to have a good, good time. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should absolutely sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You could do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V O X A N D H O P S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened throughout the past week in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, including all the details for any episode episodes which I have dropped throughout that past week, if I've been a guest on someone else's podcast, all of the information for any cool projects that I have coming up, the links to the upcoming live interview Thirsty Thursday Virtual Hangs, as well as the links to the Brutal Awakening playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify and is curated by my man, Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself. Do yourself a favor, everyone, sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing us because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on and I would hate for you to miss something the vox and hops metal podcast is brought to you by sound talent media i hope that you have a glorious weekend i will be back next week with two episodes but until then remember to enjoy life metal and craft beer cheers vox and hops heads oh,